controls that fertility of those fields. Almaka was responsible for water and the life it created around Marib. Ten kilometers away from the site is an even more potent symbol of how vital water was to the life of Marib, the Great Marib Dam. Described in Arabian folklore as a miracle of engineering, the Marib Dam spanned 3,000 feet, twice the width of Colorado's Hoover Dam. It was built to contain twice yearly flash floods that struck the dam with a force of 2,000 tons of water and silt per second. Surging off the nearby mountains into a catchment area of 10,000 square kilometers, the dam was one of a series whose origins stretched back to 1500 BC. Royal inscriptions on these dams have helped establish the very first chronology of Sabaean rulers. What we see here is very important. It's a Sabaean inscription. It tells us about the construction of th this reservoir, this part of the dam, and for the distributing of uh, the water, the flood, to the south uh, oasis. As yet, which of these rulers might have been the real Queen of Sheba remains unclear. But one thing is certain. Maintaining this all-important dam would have been one of the Sabaean Queen's most fundamental obligations to her people. The dam harnessed the region's flash floods to create a fertile oasis of 24,000 acres. And they built at Marib an agricultural scheme that has really not been equal to our day. Uh, a single dam that could water enough cropland to feed upwards of 40, 50,000 people, relying strictly on seasonal flash floods, you know, an, an amazing achievement. In the Quran, Sheba's homeland was known as the Garden of Two Paradises. The oasis that the Marib Dam created fits its description almost exactly. This highly sophisticated irrigation network allowed Marib to flourish as a wealthy and important center of trade. Once that was in place, their living was, was pretty easy. And it got a lot easier when they realized that on top of that, they had these luxury goods, uh, which the Romans and the Greeks and others further north lusted for. And with their caravans, they could uh, make staggering profits uh, enough so that uh, the Romans said that basically these were the richest people in the world. Like the wealthiest cultures of the modern world, Sheba's Marib played host to skyscrapers, astonishing tower houses of mud brick and timber that stretched over 80 feet in the air. An echo of Marib's distinctive high-rise buildings can still be found in Yemen's modern capital of Sana'a. And like Sana'a, Marib would once have bustled with merchants and traders. They traded in many goods. Gold from Africa, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, amber from Ethiopia. But the most important product of all was the Sabaean specialty, frankincense. The aroma of this precious incense was reputed to bring worshippers closer to their gods. So by the time it arrived in far off Jerusalem, it was more valuable than gold. Protecting the trade routes to such far-flung places was another of the Sabaean monarch's most important duties. So perhaps the real motive for Sheba journeying to visit King Solomon was to protect or initiate a trade arrangement, an arrangement upon which her city depended. Today, Marib lies empty, the consequence of civil war over a generation ago. Now its only occupants are the occasional Bedouin family who make temporary homes amongst its ruined towers. the nearby archaeological site, Brian's underground scan has detected a previously unknown feature 
linking the city to the temple. We're standing right on top of the western doorway right now that is perfectly in line with the ancient city of Marib. It's hypothesized that there was some kind of processional way along here that would lead the people from the city to the, uh, the temple itself. After doing our geophysical surveys out in the western side of the site, we've done a couple of uh, trial investigations and found three and a quarter meters below the surface and two of the holes so far, a stone surface that might be the uh, processional walkway. What might this processional way have meant for Sheba herself? The symbolic significance of a, a processional way might be that it takes a long ways to get here, so you have time to think about what it is that you want to ask of the deity or thank the deity for intervening, but also along the way, as in uh, our own cultures today, we have billboards and tall buildings that are icons and symbols of all sorts of uh, issues of wealth and, and marketing and all of that. We have to imagine similar kinds of uh, symbolism along the way here too, to make the pilgrim feel like they're coming into a place of holy sanctity. On important days in the Sabean calendar, pilgrims and their queen would have walked along this eight kilometer processional way. Inscriptions on the temple walls tell us many of them had traveled from distant lands. And en route, they would have brought an offering for their god. At the temple itself, Bill and his team believe they have the most complete picture yet of how the ancient people of Saba worshipped at their most holy shrine. We're standing here in front of the main entrance to the sanctuary known as the Mahram Bilqis, the sacred precinct of Bilqis. And Bilqis, of course, is Arab folklore's uh, name for the otherwise nameless Queen of Sheba. Right now, coming through the center part of the peristyle hall, which was a large open hall with pillars around the sides and behind me that once had a covered walkway or portico around it. And imagine four meters below the sand beneath my feet, there were all sorts of dedications of the pious pilgrims laid all around in here. So many offerings made to al Maka, the most important deity of the ancient kingdom of Saba. Combining the discoveries of Wendell Phillips with the latest data from the team's underground survey, it is now possible to create a vision of Southern Arabia's most spectacular shrine. It was along the temple's processional way that 3,000 years ago, the Queen of Sheba might have walked the night before she embarked on her perilous journey to Jerusalem. Queen, high priestess, and now trade envoy, Sheba would have entered the temple through the 40-foot high columns of the peristyle entrance. Imagine going through that, smelling the fragrance of frankincense burning on altars, perhaps hearing the bleeding of goats and, and sheep and other animals as they're being ritually sacrificed to the deity. Sculptures in gleaming bronze staring down at you, showing the presence of the deity. This must have been overwhelming. Walking through the great hall, a set of doors led through to the most holy place of all, the temple's sacred enclosure. Fragments of bronze recovered from the enclosure suggest that it contained the most sacred idols of Sabaean culture. Among them, a towering 30-foot high bull. The bull in ancient Semitic cultures is a storm god, or a representation of a storm god. You have to think of the snorting of a bull and the hoofs trampling on the ground and that thunderous roar. It emulates uh, the sound of uh, thunderclaps, which always bring in rain. And the rain is absolutely critical because it's that water, that rainwater that falls, that helps uh, to irrigate fields. After offering a final blood sacrifice, the Queen of Sheba would have left her temple, beginning an epic 3,000-mile round trip to Jerusalem.